Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you uh, for the hosts and hellos. I hope you're all doing well. Uh, this is it. Oh, this is in the way, isn't it? Let me move this over here. Um, this is it today. Uh, this is the end. We've got um, just this one last chunk left, and um, I'm feeling a little bit uh, bittersweet about it. Um, I'm glad to finally be done. It's a project that has taken over three years of my stream career. I started, I tried out book one um, in, uh, I think, the late summer or early fall of 20. 16 and now we're in 2020 so it's been over three years of this work and um uh, uh well i wouldn't say work this fun um to read uh this series for you all so um it being my favorite series of course um helps um and i'm sad to be coming to the end of it again uh but i'm really excited to be sharing um so i just kind of wanted to say that going into it thank you all for watching um, everything that, that of, of this series so far, if you've made it this far, I appreciate you and commend you and hope that you have enjoyed uh, my reading of this series as much as I enjoy this series. I'm going to mute it so technically it's not over. Aww. And hello, Muerta, how are you? Um, so saying that, uh, this will be a little bit longer of a stream than last night's. Um, or part two. Uh, this is four chapters today instead of three, the final four. And um, so uh, it's going to take a little bit longer, um, especially because these are a little bit heftier chapters too. So that in mind, um, I'm ready if you guys are, and we're going to jump right on in. But it's great to see everybody today before I say that. And again, if you're watching this um, on VOD or YouTube later. Uh, I appreciate you popping in for the end as well. Oh, before I get started, I want to ask um, if the music is too loud. Hello, I'm back. Wow, from all the beginning to now. By the way, I would subscribe for the rest of my life. That's the only reason I downloaded Twitch. Oh, well, I mean, I'm always going to be doing other projects. Um, hello, HS, by the way. Um, I'm always going to be doing other projects. I play a lot of games on my channel. That's primarily what I do. Uh, but I don't plan to stop the books. Um, so it, it'll be different stories, obviously. But um, if you enjoy the reading, that will continue in between the games and stuff. I'm on Super Lurk due to spoilers. Thank you. Good luck with not crying. Thanks. Hi, Paige. How are you? It's great to have you. Um, I assume that the that the, audio's, the audio is okay. Um... If not, just yell at me real quick. Uh, but uh, I'm going to assume that uh, no news is good news. So here we go. There is a little bit of music, um, but it hasn't... It's not playing very loudly, and that's... Hey, Rock. I'll be quiet so you can tell me. Yeah, I just want it to be faint, so, um, because some songs are louder than others, and I would rather the quieter songs be kind of quiet, like, a little too faint, than the louder songs to be, like, overwhelming. Okay, let me move my phone over there so it doesn't hear. Okay, now we're gonna jump in. Chapter 11. Perhaps one night when you were very small... Someone tucked you into bed and read you a story called The Little Engine That Could. And if so, then you have my profound sympathies as it is one of the most tedious stories on earth. The story probably puts you right to sleep, which is the reason I read it to children. So I will remind you that the story involves the engine of a train that for some reason has the ability to think and talk. Someone asks the little engine that could to do a difficult task too dull for me to describe, and the engine isn't sure it can accomplish this, but it begins to, but it begins to mutter to itself, I think I can, I think I can, I think I can. And before long, it has muttered its way to success. The moral of the story is that if you tell yourself you can do something, then you can actually do it. A moral that is easily disproved if you tell yourself that you can eat nine pints of ice cream in a single sitting, 
or that you can shipwreck yourself on a distant island simply by setting off in a rented canoe with holes sawed into it. I only mention the story of the little engine that could so that when I say that the Baudelaire orphans, as they left the Arboretum with Ishmael and headed back toward the island colony, were on board the little engine that couldn't, you will understand what I mean. For one thing, the children were being dragged back to Ishmael's tent on a large wooden sleigh, helmed by Ishmael in his enormous clay chair, and dragged by the island's wild sheep. As if you have ever wondered why horse-drawn carriages and dog sleds are far more common modes of travel than sheep-dragged sleighs, it is because sheep are not well, in, are not well suited for employment in the transportation industry. The sheep meandered and detoured lollygagged and moseyed, and occasionally stopped to nibble on wild grass or simply breathe in the morning air, and Ishmael tried to convince the sheep to go faster through his facilitation skills rather than through standard shepherding procedures. I don't want to force you, he kept saying, but perhaps you sheep could go a bit faster, and the sheep would merely stare blankly at the old man and keep shuffling along. But the Baudelaire orphans were on board the little engine that couldn't, not only because of the sheep's languor, a word which here means inability to pull a large wooden sleigh at a reasonable pace, but because their own thoughts were not spurring them to action. Unlike the engine in the tedious story, no matter what Violet, Klaus, and Sonny told themselves, they could not imagine a successful solution to their difficulties. The children tried to tell themselves that they would do as Ishmael had suggested and lead a safe life on the colony, but they could not imagine abandoning Kit Snicket on the coastal shelf or letting her return to the world to see that justice would be served without accompanying her on this noble errand. The siblings tried to tell themselves that they would obey their parents' wishes and stay sheltered from their unfortunate history, but they did not think that they could keep themselves away from the Arboretum or from reading what their parents had written in that enormous book. The Baudelaire's tried to tell themselves that they would join Erewhon and Finn in the mutiny at breakfast, but they could not picture threatening the facilitator and his supporters with weapons, particularly because they had not brought any from the Arboretum. They tried to tell themselves that at least they could be glad that Count Olaf was not a threat, but they could not quite approve of his being locked in a birdcage, and they shuddered to think of the fungus hidden in his gown and the scheme hidden in his head. And throughout the entire journey over the Bray and back toward the beach, the three children tried to tell themselves that everything was all right. But of course, everything was not all right. Everything was all wrong, and Violet, Klaus, and Sonny did not quite know how a safe place, far from the treachery of the world, had become so dangerous and complicated as soon as they had arrived. The Baudelaire orphan sat in the sleigh, staring at Ishmael's clay-covered clay feet, and no matter how many times they thought they could, they thought they could, they thought they could think of an end to their troubles, they knew it simply was not the case. Finally, however, the sheep dragged the sleigh across the beach's white sands and through the opening of the enormous tent. Once again, the joint was hopping, but the gathered islanders were in the midst of an argy bargy, a word for argument that is far less cute than it sounds. Despite the presence of an opiate and seashells dangling from the waist of every colonist, the islanders were anything but drowsy and inactive. Alonzo was grabbing the arm of Willa, who was shrieking in annoyance while stepping on Dr. Kurtz's foot. Sherman's face was even redder than usual as he threw sand in the face of Mr. Pitcairn, who appeared to be trying to bite Brewster's finger. <laughs> Professor Fletcher was shouting at Ariel, and Miss Marlowe was stomping her feet at Calypso, and Madame Nordoff and Rabbi Bly seemed ready to begin wrestling on the sand. Byam twirled his mustache at Ferdinand, while Robinson tugged his beard at Larson, and Waden seemed to tear out his, her red hair for no reason at all. Jonah and Sadie Bellamy were standing face to face arguing, while Friday and Mrs. Caliban were standing back to back as if they would never speak to each other again. And all the while, Amaris stood near Ishmael's chair with his hands held suspiciously behind his back. While Ishmael gaped at the islanders in amazement, the three children stepped off the sleigh and walked quickly toward Erewhon and Finn, who were looking at them expectantly. "'Where were you?' Finn said." We waited as long as we could for you to return, but we had to leave your friend behind and begin the mutiny. You left Kit out there alone? Violet said. You promised you'd stay with her. And you promised us weapons, said Erewhon. Where are they, Baudelaire's? We don't have any, Klaus admitted. Ishmael was at the Arboretum. Count Olaf was right, 
Erewhon said. You failed us, Baudelaire's. What do you mean Count Olaf was right? Violet demanded. What do you mean Ishmael was at the Arboretum? Finn demanded. What do you mean what do I mean? Erewhon demanded. What you mean what you mean what I mean? Sunny demanded. Please, everyone, Ishmael cried from his clay chair. I suggest we all take a few sips of cordial and discuss this cordially. I'm tired of drinking cordial, Professor Fletcher said, and I'm tired of your suggestions, Ishmael. Call me Ish, the facilitator said. I'm calling you a bad facilitator, retorted Calypso. Please, everyone, Ishmael cried again with a nervous tug at his beard. What is all this oggy boggy about? I'll tell you what it's about, Alonzo said. I washed up on these shores many years ago, after enduring a terrible storm and a dreadful political scandal. So what? Rabbi Blyce asked. Eventually everyone washes up on these shores. I wanted to leave my unfortunate history behind, Alonzo said, and live a peaceful life, free from trouble. But now there are some colonists talking of mutiny. If we're not careful, the island will become as treacherous as the rest of the world. Mutiny? Ishmael said in horror. Who dares talk of mutiny? I dare, Erewhon said. I'm tired of your facilitation, Ishmael. I washed ashore on this island after living on another island even farther away. I was tired of a peaceful life and ready for adventure, but whenever anything exciting ar arrives on this island, you immediately have it thrown into the Arboretum. It depends on how you look at it, Ishmael protested. I don't force anyone to throw anything away. Ishmael is right, Ariel cried. Some of us have had enough adventure for a lifetime. I washed up on these shores after finally escaping from prison, where I had disguised myself as a young man for years. I stayed here as my, for my own safety, not to participate in more dangerous schemes. Then you should join our mutiny, Sherman cried. Ishmael is not to be trusted. We abandoned the Baudelaire's on the coastal shelf, and now he's brought him back. The Baudelaire's never should have been abandoned in the first place, Miss Marlowe cried. All they wanted to do was help their friend. Their f friend is suspicious, claimed Mr. Pitcairn. She arrived on a raft of books. So what, said Waden. I arrived on a raft of books myself. But you abandoned them, Professor Fletcher pointed out. She did nothing of the sort, cried Larson. You helped her hide them so you could force those children to read. We wanted to learn to read, Friday insisted. You're reading? Mrs. Caliban gasped in astonishment. "'You shouldn't be reading!' cried Madame Nordoff. "'Well, you shouldn't be yodeling!' cried Dr. Kurtz. "'You're yodeling?' Rabbi Bly said in astonishment. "'Maybe we should have a mutiny after all.' "'Yodeling is better than carrying a flashlight!' Jonah cried, pointing at Finn accusingly. "'Carrying a flashlight is better than hiding a picnic basket!' Sadie cried, pointing at Erewhon. "'Hiding a picnic basket is better than pocketing a whisk!' Erewhon said, pointing at Sunny. These secrets will destroy us, Ariel said. Life here is supposed to be simple. There's nothing wrong with a complicated life, said Byam. I lived a simple life as a sailor for many years, and I was bored to tears until I was shipwrecked. Bored to tears, Friday said in astonishment. All I want is the simple life my mother and father had together, without arguing or keeping secrets. That's enough, Ishmael said quickly. I suggest that we stop arguing. I suggest we continue to argue, said Erewhon. I suggest we abandon Ishmael and his supporters, cried Professor Fletcher. I suggest we abandon the mutineers, cried Calypso. I suggest better food, cried another islander. I suggest more cordial, cried another. I suggest a more attractive robe. I suggest a proper house of, instead of a tent. I suggest fresh water. I suggest eating bitter apples. I suggest chopping down the apple tree. I suggest burning up the outrigger. I suggest a talent show. I suggest reading a book. I suggest burning all books. I suggest yodeling. I suggest forbidding yodeling. I suggest a safe place. I suggest a complicated life. I suggest it depends on how you look at it. I suggest justice. I suggest breakfast. I suggest we stay and you leave. I suggest you stay and we leave. I suggest we return to Winnipeg. The Baudelaire's looked at one another in despair as the mutinous schism worked its way through the colony. Seashells hung open at the waist of the islanders, but there was no cordi cordiality evident as the islanders turned against one another in fury. 
even if they were friends or members of the same family or shared a history or a secret organization. The siblings had seen angry crowds before, of course, from the mob psychology to the citizens of the citizens in the village of Faldevotes to the blind justice of the trial at the Hotel de Numont, but they had never seen a community divide so suddenly and so completely. Violet, Klaus, and Sonny watched the schism unfold and could imagine what the other schisms must have been like, from the schism that split VFD to the schism that drove their parents away from the very same island, to all the other schisms in the world's sad history, with every person suggesting something different, every story like the layer of an onion, and every unfortunate event like a chapter in an enormous book. The Baudelaire's watched the terrible argy bargy and wondered how they could have hoped the island would be a safe place, far from the treachery of the world when eventually every treachery washed up on its shores. Like a castaway tossed by a storm at sea and divided the people who lived there. The arguing voices of the islanders grew louder and louder with everyone suggesting something but nobody listening to anyone else's suggestions until the schism was a deafening roar that was finally broken by the loudest voice of all. Silence, bellowed a figure who entered the tent, and the islanders stopped talking at once and stared in amazement at the person who stood glaring at them in a long dress that bulged at the belly. What are you doing here? gasped someone from the back of the tent. We abandoned you on the coastal shelf. The figure strode into the middle of the tent, and I'm sorry to tell you it was not Kit Snicket, who was still in a long dress that bulged at the belly on top of her library raft, but Count Olaf whose bulging belly, of course, was the diving helmet containing the medusoid mycelium, whose orange and yellow dress the Baudelaire suddenly recognized as the dress Esme Squalor wore on top of the Mortmain Mountains, a hideous thing fashioned to look like an enormous fire, which had somehow washed onto the island shores like everything else. As Olaf paused to give the siblings a particularly wicked smile, the children tried to imagine the secret history of Esme's dress, and how, like the ring Violet still held in her hand, it had returned to the Baudelaire story after all this time. "'You can't abandon me,' the villain snarled to the islander. "'I'm the king of Olaf Land!' "'This isn't Olaf Land,' Ishmael said with a stern tug on his beard. "'And you're no king, Olaf!' Count Olaf threw back his head and laughed, his tattered dress quivering in mirth a phrase which here means making unpleasant rustling noises. With a sneer, he pointed at Ishmael, who still sat in the chair. Oh, Ish, he said, his eyes shining bright. I told you many years ago that I would triumph over you some day, and at last that day has arrived. My associate with the weekday for a name told me that you were still hiding out on this island. And Thursday, Mrs. Caliban said. Olaf frowned and blinked at the freckled woman. No, he said, Monday. She was trying to blackmail an old woman who was involved in a political scandal. Gonzalo? Alonzo said. Olaf frowned again. No, he said. We'd gone bird watching, this old man and I, when we decided to rob a sealing schooner owned by Humphrey, Waden said. No, Olaf said with another frown. There was some argument about his name, actually, as a baby adopted by his orphan children also bore the same name. Bertrand? Omeris said. No, Olaf said and frowned yet another time. The adoption papers were hidden in the hat of a banker who'd been promoted to vice president in charge of orphan affairs. Mr. Poe? asked Sadie. Yes, Olaf said with a scowl, although at the time he was better known under his stage name. But I'm not here to discuss the past. I'm here to discuss the future. Your mutineering islanders let me out of this cage, Ishmael, to force you off the island and crown me as king. King, Erewhon said. That wasn't the plan, Olaf. If you want to live, old woman, Olaf said rudely, I suggest you do whatever I say. You're already giving us suggestions, Brewster said incredulously. You're just like Ishmael, although your outfit is prettier. Thank you, Count Olaf said with a wicked smile. But there's another important difference between me and this foolish facilitator. Your tattoo? Friday guessed. No, Count Olaf said with a frown. If you were to wash the clay off Ishmael's feet, you'd see he has the same tattoo I do. Eyeliner? guessed Madame Nordoff. No, Count Olaf said sharply. The difference is that Ishmael is unarmed. He abandoned his weapons long ago during the VFD schism, refusing to use violence of any sort. But today, you'll all see how foolish he is. 
He paused and ran his filthy hands along his bulging belly before turning to the facilitator, who was taking something from Amaris's hands. I have the only weapon that can threaten you and your supporters, he bragged. I'm the king of Olaf land and there's nothing you and your sheep can do about it. Don't be so sure about that, Ishmael said and raised an object in the air so everyone could see it. It was the harpoon gun that had washed ashore with Olaf and the Baudelaire's after being used to fire at crows at the Hotel de Numont and at a self-sustaining hot airmobile home in the village of Foul Devotees, and at, cotton candy machine, and at a cotton candy machine of a county fair when the Baudelaire parents were very, very young. Now the weapon was adding another chapter to its secret history and was pointing right at Count Olaf. I had Omeris keep this weapon handy, Ishmael said, instead of tossing it in the arboretum because I thought you might escape from that cage, Count Olaf, just as I escaped from the cage you put me in when you set fire to my home. I didn't set that fire, Count Olaf said, his eyes shining bright. I've had enough of your lies, Ishmael said and stood up from his chair. Realizing that the facilitator's feet were not injured after all, the islanders gasped, which requires a large intake of breath, a dangerous thing to do if spores of a deadly fungus are in the air. I'm going to do what I should have done years ago, Olaf, and slaughter you. I'm going to fire this harpoon gun right into that bulging belly of yours. No! screamed the Baudelaire's in unison, but even the combined voices of the three children were not as loud as Count Olaf's villainous laughter, and the facilitator never heard the children's cry as he pulled the bright red trigger of the terrible weapon. The children heard a click, then a whoosh as the harpoon was fired, and then as it struck Count Olaf right where Ishmael had promised, they heard the shattering of glass and the medusoid mycelium, with its own secret history of treachery and violence, was free at last to circulate in the air even in this safe place so far from the world. Everyone in the tent gasped. Islanders and colonists, men and women, children and orphans, volunteers and villains, and everyone in between. Everyone breathed in the spores of the deadly fungus as Count Olaf toppled backward onto the sand, still laughing, even as he gasped himself. And in an instant, the schism of the island was over, because everyone in this place, including, of course, the Baudelaire orphans, was suddenly part of the same unfortunate event. It's the end of chapter 11. Let me catch up on all the chat. Uh, I'm sorry you're frustrated, Rock. Oh, bye, Trey. Have a good day. Uh, good luck with laundry and school, Paige. I rented Star uh, Jedi Fallen Order, but it won't work. I'm so sorry. Thank you for shouting out HS and Paige. Hey, Storm. I hate when my sheep drawn sled goes too slowly. <laughs> Same. Thank you for that host, HS. I'm pretty good. Oh, I'm so sorry my bot purged you. I have family friendly, friendly filter on my bot, so. <laughs> it purged your naughty wood. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry about that. Don't hate me. Oh, good luck with your basketball games. The Islanders do have some sass. Hey Moocher, how are you doing today? I suggest a lot of things. Olaf Land, what a clever name for a land. Olafi Land sounds better. Hey, Reedy. You relate to Olaf's terrible lying skills so hard. Are you, are you, do you lie a lot? Are we learning about you right now? Welcome back from the purge. I can unmute now. Okay. <laughs> Hope you're having a good day, Riddy. Hate me instead, Storm, who made fun of you for getting purged. Psh, psh, no? Oh, okay. I'm still on chapter nine. I mean, book nine. Oh, I see, I see. Well, you still have some, some books to catch up on then. Hello, hi again. Hello, hi again, Paige. 
Yeah, that would be good, Rock. I mean, I don't know, you're convincing me right now, Storm. So, I'm, I'm convinced. Okay. <clears throat> I could never hate my vegan cuis cuisine partner. So convinced. No, I don't think Tara's vegan at all. And I don't think Storm is vegan either. Oh, thanks, Rock. I appreciate that. Alright, here we go. Now we got mushrooms, poison mushroom spores flying around everywhere. Thanks a lot, Ishmael. <clears throat> Singing time? Oh, Storm Redeemed with the sing thing? Um... Uh, uh, come on, shake your body, baby, do the conga. No, you can't control yourself any longer. Feel the rhythm of the beat, it's getting stronger. Uh, um, something, something, do the conga beat. <laughs> I know the words. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I'm gonna play it because no, I'm not. I'm not. Dance it to something, something, conga. Yeah, good. I'm glad you're dancing. I have memories of that song being from being on the Disney cruise when I was seven. That's funny. How specific of a memory. That's cool. I'm gonna scooch this, you silly bit. Okay. Let's move along. We still have a good chunk of the book. We have this much to read. Much more. We've already read all that. Okay. <clears throat> Look. Twins. I'm just kidding. Okay. There was this dance party on 4th of July and I remember dancing. That's a fun memory. Okay. <clears throat> Chapter 12. It's a curious thing, but as one travels the world getting older and older, it appears that happiness is easier to get used to than despair. The second time you have a root beer float, for instance, your happiness at sipping the delicious concoction may not be quite as enormous as when you first had a root beer float. And the twelfth time, your happiness may still be less enormous, until root beer floats begin to offer you very little happiness at all, because you have become used to the taste of vanilla ice cream and root beer mixed together. However, the second time you find a thumbtack in your root beer th float, your despair is much greater than the first time, when you dismiss the thumbtack as a freak accident rather than part of the scheme of the soda jerk, a phrase which here means ice cream shop employee who is trying to injure your tongue. And by the twelfth time you find a thumbtack, your despair is even greater still, until you can hardly utter the phrase root beer float without bursting into tears. It is almost as if happiness is an acquired taste, like coconut corchal or ceviche, to which you can eventually become accustomed, but despair is something surprising each time you encounter it. As the glass shattered in the tent, the Baudelaire orphans stood and stared at the standing figure of Ishmael, but even as they felt the medusoid mycelium drift into their bodies, each tiny spore feeling like the footstep of an ant walking down their throats, they could not believe that their own story could contain such despair once more, or that such a terrible thing had happened. "'What happened?' Friday cried. "'I heard glass breaking!' "'Never mind the breaking glass,' Erewhon said. I, "'I feel something in my throat like a tiny seed.' "'Never mind your seedy throat,' Finn said. "'I see Ishmael standing up on his own two feet.' Count Olaf cackled from the white sand where he lay. With one dramatic gesture, he yanked the harpoon out of the mess of broken helmet and tattered dress at his stomach and threw it at Ishmael's clay feet. The sound you heard was the shattering of a diving helmet, he sneered. The seeds you feel in your throat are the spores of the medusoid mycelium, and the man standing on his own two feet is the one who slaughtered you all. The medusoid mycelium? Ishmael repeated in astonishment as the islanders gasped again. On these shores? It can't be! I've spent my life trying to keep the island forever safe from that terrible fungus. Nothing's safe forever, thank goodness, Count Olaf said. And you of all people should know that eventually everything washes up on these shores. 
The Baudelaire family has finally returned to this island after you threw them off years ago, and they brought the medusoid mycelium with them. Ishmael's eyes widened, and he jumped off the edge of the sleigh to stand and confront the Baudelaire orphans. As his feet landed on the ground, the clay cracked and fell away, and the children could see that the facil facilitator had a tattoo of an eye on his left ankle, just as Count Olaf had said. "'You brought the medusoid mycelium?' he asked. "'You had a deadly fungus with you all this time, and you kept it a secret from us.' "'You're a fine one to talk about keeping secrets,' Alonzo said. "'Look at your healthy feet, Ishmael. Your dishonesty is the root of this trouble.' It's the mutineers who are the root of the trouble, cried Ariel. If they hadn't let Count Olaf out of the cage, this would have never happened. It depends on how you look at it, Professor Fletcher said. In my opinion, all of us are the root of the trouble. If we hadn't put Count Olaf in the cage, he would have never, never threatened us. We're the root of the trouble because we failed to find the diving helmet, Ferdinand said. If we'd retrieved it while storm scavenging, the sheep would have dragged it to the arboretum and we would have been safe. Omeros is the root of the trouble, Dr. Kurtz said, pointing at the young boy. He's the one who gave Ishmael the harpoon gun instead of dumping it in the arboretum. It's Count Olaf who's the root of the trouble, cried Larson. He's the one who brought the fungus into the tent. I'm not the root of the trouble, Count Olaf snarled, then paused to cough loudly before continuing. I'm the king of the island. It doesn't matter whether you're king or not, Violet said. You've breathed in the fungus like everyone else. Violet's right, Klaus said. We don't have time to stand here arguing. Even without his commonplace book, Klaus could recite a poem about the fungus that was first recited to him by Fiona shortly before she had broken his heart. A single spore has such grim power that you may die within the hour, he said. If we don't quit our fighting and work together, we will all end up dead. The tent was filled with ululate, ululation, a word which here means the sound of panicking islanders. Dead! Madame Nordoff shrieked. Nobody said the fungus was deadly. I thought we were merely being threatened with forbidden food. I didn't stay on this island to die, cried Mrs. Marlowe. I could have died at home. Nobody is going to die, Ishmael announced to the crowd. It depends on how you look at it, Rabbi Bly said. Eventually we're all going to die. Not if you follow my suggestions, Ishmael insisted. Now first I suggest that everyone take a nice long drink from their seashells. The cordial will chase the fungus from your throats. No, it won't. Violet cried. Fermented coconut milk has no effect on a medusoid mycelium. That may be so, Ishmael said, but at least we'll all feel a bit calmer. You mean drowsy and inactive? Klaus corrected. The cordial's an opiate. There's nothing wrong with cordiality, Ishmael said. I suggest we all spend a few minutes discussing our situation in a cordial manner. We can decide what the root of the problem is and come up with a solution at our leisure. That does sound reasonable, Calypso admitted. Tration des clerks, Sonny cried, which meant you're forgetting about the quick-acting poison in the fungus. Sonny's right, Klaus said. We need to find a solution now, not sit around talking about it over beverages. The solution is in the arboretum, Violet said, and in the secret place under the roots of the apple tree. Secret space, Sherman said. What secret space? There's a library down there, Klaus said, and the crowd murmured in surprise cataloging all of the objects that have washed ashore and all of the objects those all the stories those objects tell and kitchen sunny added maybe horseradish horseradish is the one way to dilute the poison violet explained and recited the rest of the poem the children had heard aboard the queequeg is dilution simple but of course just one small dose of root of horse she looked around at the she looked around the tent at the frightened faces of the islanders the kitchen beneath the apple tree might have horseradish, she said. We can save ourselves if we hurry. They're lying, Ishmael said. There's nothing in the arboretum but junk, and nothing underneath the tree but dirt. The Baudelaire's are trying to trick you. We're not trying to trick anyone, Klaus said. We're trying to save everyone. The Baudelaire's knew the, Baudelaire's knew the medusoid mycelium was here, Ishmael pointed out, and they never told us. You can't trust them, but you can trust me, and I suggest we all sit and sip our cordials. Razoo, Sunny said, which meant you're not the one to be trusted. But rather than translate, her sibling stepped closer to Ishmael so they could speak to him in relative privacy. Why are you doing this? Violet asked. If you just sit here and drink cordial, you will be doomed. We've all breathed in the same poison, Klaus said. We're all in the same boat. 
Ishmael raised his eyebrows and gave the children a grim smile. We'll see about that, he said. Now get out of my tent. Hightail it, Sunny said, which meant we'd better hurry, and her siblings nodded in agreement. The Baudelaire orphans quickly left the tent, looking back to get one more glimpse of the worried islanders, the scowling facilitator, and Count Olaf, who still lay on the sand clutching his belly, as if the harpoon had not just destroyed the diving helmet, but wounded him, too. Violet, Klaus, and Sunny did not travel back to the far side of the island by sheep-dragged sleigh, but even as they hurried over the bray, they felt as if they were aboard the little engine that couldn't, not only because of the desperate nature of their errand, but because of the poison they felt working its wicked way through the Baudelaire systems. Violet and Klaus learned what their sister had gone through deep beneath the ocean's surface when Sunny had nearly perished from the fungus's deadly poison, and Sunny received a refresher course, a phrase which here means another opportunity to feel the stalks and caps of the medusoid mycelium begin to spout and sprout in her little throat. The children had to stop several times to cough, as the growing fungus was making it difficult to breathe, and by the time they stood underneath the branches of the apple tree, the Baudelaire orphans were wheezing heavily in the afternoon sun. "'We don't have much time,' Violet said between breaths. "'We'll go straight to the kitchen,' Klaus said, walking through the gap in the tree's roots as the incredibly deadly viper had shown them. "'Hope horseradish,' Sunny said, following her brother." but when the Baudelaire's reached the kitchen, they were in for a disappointment. Violet flicked the switch that lit up the kitchen, and the three children hurried to the spice rack, reading the labels on the jars and bottles one by one, but as they searched their hopes, began to fade. The children found many of their favorite spices, including sage, oregano, and paprika, which was available in a number of varieties organized according to their level of smokiness. They found some of their least favorite spices, including dried parsley, which scarcely tastes like anything, and garlic salt, which, which forces the taste of everything else to flee. They found spices they associated with certain dishes, such as turmeric, which their father used to use while making curried peanut soup, and nutmeg, nut, and nutmeg, which their mother used to mix into gingerbread. And they found spices they did not associate with anything, such as marjoram, which everyone owns but scarcely ever uses, and powdered lemon peel, which should only be used in emergencies, such as when fresh lemons have become extinct. They found spices used practically everywhere, such as salt and pepper, and spices used in certain regions, such as chipotle peppers and vindaloo rub, but none of the labels read horseradish, and when they opened the jars and bottles, none of the powders, leaves, and seeds inside smelled like the horseradish factory that once stood on Lousy Lane. It doesn't have to be horseradish, Violet said quickly, putting down a jar of tarragon in frustration. Wasabi was an adequate substitution when Sunny was infected. Or you tremor, Sunny wheezed. There's no wasabi here either, Klaus said, sniffing a jar of mace and frowning. Maybe it's hidden somewhere? Who would hide horseradish, Violet asked after a long cough. Our parents, Sunny said. Sonny's right, Klaus said. If they knew about Anne Whistle Aquatics, they might have known of the dangers of the medusoid mycelium. Any horseradish that washed up on the island would have had would have been very valuable indeed. We don't have time to search the entire arboretum to find horseradish, Violet said. She reached into her pocket, her fingers brushing against the ring Ishmael had given her, and found the ribbon the facilitator had been using as a bookmark, which she used to tie up her hair so she might think better. That would be harder than trying to find the sugar bowl in the entire Hotel de Numont. At the mention of the sugar bowl, Klaus gave his glasses a quick polish and began to page through his commonplace book, while Sunny picked up her whisk and bit it thoughtfully. Maybe it's hidden in one of the other spice jars, the middle Baudelaire said. <clears throat> we smelled them all, Violet said between wheezes. None of them smelled like horseradish. Maybe, maybe the scent was disguised by another spice, Klaus said. Something that was even more bitter than horseradish could cover the smell. Sunny, what are some of the bitterest spices? Cloves, said Sunny and wheezed. Uh, cardamom, arrowroot, uh, wormwood. Wormwood? Klaus said thoughtfully and flipped the pages of his commonplace book. Kit mentioned wormwood once, he said, thinking of poor Kit alone on the coastal shelf. She said tea should be as bitter as wormwood and as sharp as a two-edged sword. We were told the same thing when we were served tea right before our ri right before our trial. No wormwood here, Sunny said. Ishmael also said something about bitter tea, Violet said, 
Remember the student of his was afraid of being poisoned? Just like we are? Klaus said, feeling the mushrooms growing inside him. I wish we'd hear heard the end of that story now. I wish we'd heard every story, Violet said, her voice sounding hoarse and rough from the poison. I wish our parents had told us everything, instead of sheltering us from the treachery of the world. Maybe they <clears throat> did, Klaus said, his voice as rough as his sister's now, and the middle Baudelaire walked to the reading chairs in the middle of the room and picked up a series of unfortunate events. They wrote all of their secrets here. If <clears throat> they hid the horseradish, we'll find it in this book. We don't have time to read that entire book, Violet said, any more than we have time to search the entire arboretum. If we fail, Sunny said, her voice heavy with fungus, at least we die reading together. The Baudelaire orphans nodded grimly and embraced one another. Like most people, the children had occasionally been in a curious and somewhat morbid mood and had spent a few moments wondering about the circumstances of their own deaths, although since that unhappy day on Briny Beach when Mr. Poe had first informed them about the terrible fire, the children had spent so much time trying to avoid their own deaths that they preferred not to think about it in their time off. Most people do not choose their final circumstances, of course, and if the Baudelaire's had been given the choice, they would have liked to live to a very old age, which, for all I know, they may be doing. But if the three children had to perish while they were th still three children, then perishing in one another's company while reading words written long ago by their mother and father was much better than many other things they could imagine, and so the three Baudelaire's sat together in one of the reading chairs, preferring to be close to one another rather than having more room to sit. And together they opened the enormous book and turned back the pages until they reached the moment in history when their parents arrived on the island and began taking notes. The entries in the book alternated between the handwriting of the Baudelaire father and the handwriting of the Baudelaire mother, and the children could imagine their parents sitting in these same chairs, reading out loud what they had written and suggesting things to add to the register of crimes, follies, and misfortunes that, of mankind that comprised a series of unfortunate events. The children, of course, would have liked to savor each word their parents had written, the word savor, you probably know, here means read slowly as each sentence from their parents' handwriting was like a gift from beyond the grave. But as the poison of the medusoid mycelium advanced further and further, the siblings had to skim, scanning each page for the words horseradish or wasabi. As you know, if you've ever skimmed a book, you end up getting a strange view of the story with just glimpses here and there of what's going on. And some authors insert confusing sentences in the middle of a book just to confuse anyone who might be skimming. Three very short men were carrying large flat piece of wood painted to look like a living room. As the Baudelaire orphans searched for the secret they hoped they would find, they caught glimpses of other secrets their parents had kept. And as Violet, Klaus, and Sunny spotted the names of people the Baudelaire parents had known, things they had whispered to these people, the codes hidden in those whispers, and many other intriguing details, the children hoped they would have the opportunity to reread a series of unfortunate events on a less frantic occasion. On that afternoon, however, they read faster and faster, looking desperately for the one secret that might save them as the hour began to pass and the medusoid mycelium grew faster and faster inside them, as if the deadly fungus also did not have time to savor its treacherous path. As they read more and more, it grew harder and harder for the Baudelaire's to breathe, and when Klaus finally spotted one of the words he had been looking for, he thought for a moment it was just a vision brought on by all the stalks and caps growing inside him. Horseradish, he said, his voice rough and wheezy. Look, <clears throat> Ishmael's fear-mongering has stopped work on the passageway, even though we have a plethora of horseradish in case of any emergency. Violet started to speak, but then choked on the fungus and coughed for a long while. "'What does fear-mongering mean?' she said finally. "'Plethora?' Sunny's voice was a little more than a mushroom-choked whisper. "'Fear-mongering means <clears throat> making people afraid,' Klaus said, whose vocabulary was unaffected by the poison. "'And plethora means more than enough.' He gave a large, shuddering wheeze and continued to read. "'We're attempting a botanical hybrid through the tuberous canopy,' which should bring safety to fruition, despite its dangers to our associates in utero. Of course, in case we are banished, Beatrice is hiding a small amount in a vest. The middle Baudelaire had to interrupt himself with a cough that was so violent he dropped the book to the floor. 
His sisters held him tightly as his body shook against the poison, and one pale hand pointed at the ceiling. Tuberous canopy, he wheezed finally. Our father means the roots above our heads. A botanical hybrid is a plant made from the combination of two other plants. He shuddered and his eyes behind his glasses filled with tears. I don't know what he's talking about, he said finally. Violet looked at the roots of over their heads where the periscope disappeared into the network of the tree. To her horror, she found that her vision was becoming blurry, as if the fungus was growing over her eyes. It sounds like they put the horseradish into the roots of the plant in order to make everyone safe, she said. That's what bringing safety to fruition would be, the way a tree brings its crop to fruition? A apples! cried Sunny in a strangled voice. Bitter apples! Of course, Klaus said. The tree is a hybrid, and its apples are bitter because they contain horseradish. If we eat an apple, Violet said, the fungus will be diluted. Gentry five, Sunny agreed in a croak and lowered herself off her sibling's laps, wheezing desperately as she tried to get to the gap in the roots. Klaus tried to follow her, but when he stood up, the poison made him so dizzy that he had to sit back down and clasp his throbbing head. Violet coughed painfully and gripped her brother's arm. Come on, she said in a frantic wheeze. Klaus shook his head. I'm not sure we can make it, he said. Sonny reached toward the gap in the roots and then curled to the floor in pain. Kick bucket, she asked, her voice weak and faint. We can't die here, Violet said, her voice so feeble her siblings could scarcely hear her. Our parents saved our lives in this very room many years ago without even knowing it. Maybe not, Klaus said. Maybe this is the end of our story. Tumor chop, Sunny said, but before anyone could ask what she meant, the children heard another sound, faint and strange, in the secret space beneath the apple tree their parents had hybridized with horseradish long ago. The sound was sibilant, a word which might appear to have something to do with siblings, but actually refers to a sort of whistle or hiss, such as a steam engine might make as what it comes to a stop, or an audience might make after sitting through one of Alphon Coote's plays. The Baudelaire's were so desperate and frightened that for a moment they thought it might be the sound of medusoid mycelium celebrating its poisonous triumph over the three children, or perhaps just the sound of their own hopes evaporating. But the sibilance was not the sound of evaporating hope or celebrating fungus, and thank goodness it was not the sound of a steam engine or a disgruntled theater audience, as the Baudelaire's were not strong enough to confront such things. The hissing sound came from one of the few inhabitants of the island whose story contained not one, but two shipwrecks, and perhaps because of its own sad history, this inhabitant was sympathetic to the sad history of the Baudelaire's. Although it is difficult to say how much sympathy can be felt by an animal, no matter how friendly. I do not have the courage to do much research on this matter, and my only herpetological comrade's story ended quite some time ago. So what this reptile was thinking as it slid toward the children is a detail of the Baudelaire's history that may never be revealed. But even with this missing detail, it is quite clear what happened. The snake slithered through the gap in the roots of the tree, and whatever the serpent was thinking, it was quite clear from the sibilant sound that came hissing through the reptile's clenched teeth that the incredibly deadly viper was offering the Baudelaire orphans an apple. end of chapter 12. It was my last fun memory before my parents got divorced. Oh man. Hi Pooh. Thank you for the hype. Never. Root beer floats will never not bring me happiness. True. 12 times. Until you can hardly imagine not having root beer float with a tack topping. Hi Boo. You always find th thumbtacks in your drinks. Do you have an iron throat? <laughs> By the second time, it's almost as if you should get a root beer float from somewhere else. <laughs> True. You might go see 1917 tonight. I've heard it's one of the best movies of the past year so far. Like, people are saying it was just done really, really well. Storm scavenging. Me scavenging! What you scavenging for, Storm? Trouble with a capital T. Ovulation. <laughs> It was like ululation. It was like U L U L 
Asian. Secret space. Psh, preferred that secret tunnel. Secret tunnel. Secret tunnel. Through the mountain. I think I might have that sound effect on my channel. Do you? It might be better used on V. No, no, no. You should keep it. It sounds like a nightmare or a very unfortunate event. Lousy Lane, that's my dream address. Wasabi doing in here? Not the bee! <laughs> Lousy Lane, Superman's second choice girlfriend. <laughs> F for my girl Lousy one time. <clears throat> Can't stay just saying hi. Hey, Mudfoot. Oh, love the top. Thank you. Oh, yay, a second Wasabi reference. Yes. Talk about it a lot in this book. I hope you're having a good day. Hi and bye. Fungus over the eyes makes me think of The Last of Us infected. Sibilant doesn't have to do with Sybil Shepherd. I'm not sure I know who that is. Man, I love the sound of evaporating hopes in the morning. Those happen in my room every single day. Oh my gosh, it's a Disney raid. Hey guys, how are y'all? I hope stream went fantastical. Claps for chapter 12. Watch, is it, watch out for snakes with apples. There's a serpent and apples. Is this the Garden of Eden? <laughs> yeah, that word. Ululation. Have you read Harry Potter? I've attempted to, and I just really can't get into it. It doesn't hold my interest. Scavenging for love and affection. Well, you got that here, man. We love you. You are loved. Thank you for shouting out Disney. Hello, Disney and the Raiders. It went about as good as it could have gone. Uh, I think I saw on your Discord you were doing some uh, Mario carding because the, uh, like, championships or something start, um, tournament or whatever. So I hope it went well. Harry Potter's a nerd. I don't love nerds. Well, I'm a big fat nerd even though I'm not Harry Potter. Hello, how is everyone doing? Hello. Uh, shall I call you... Joe? Joe Smashio? I don't have a Discord. Um. <laughs> uh, I don't have a Discord and I don't give out my friend code. Um, but. And I'm not playing a game. <laughs> um, as you can. I. I, uh. All bad things happen. No, I'm so sorry. Yeah, I'm not playing a game. Um, this is tagged under, uh. Uh, talk shows. Uh, so. I'm doing a, um, yes. Oh, I can call you Joe. Okay. I'm doing a book reading. Uh, so that's what I'm doing here. As you can see from the title and book cover to my right. Um, but yeah, that's, that's what I'm doing today. But thank you for the follow. I hope you're having a good day today. I'm afraid of this clip, but I'm going to open it. I didn't know I even said it like that. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. <clears throat> Shall we press along? Next book going to be Nancy Drew. Yep. And then I might start a new series in between Nancy Drew, but I haven't decided what that will be yet. But yes, the next book I'll do on stream is going to be Nancy Drew, The Bluebeard Room, which is the book that The Curse of Blackmore Manor is um, based off of. So anyway, <clears throat> ooh, ooh. So yeah, that'll be the next book I read. But Bluebeard, like that fairy tale? I'm not sure. Maybe Oxel, <laughs> right? That sounds good. Yeah, I'm really excited for it. I actually haven't read this one yet. The one, the Bluebeard Room. So also fire. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. This is Undertale music. <clears throat> how many books have you read and how are they so far? Um, I've probably read 25 books on stream, roughly. Um, I haven't counted, but this is the 13th book in this series and I've read every single one on stream, so. Aw, Boo Lap Warmer. Okay. <clears throat> Chapter 13. 
It is a well-known but curious fact that the first bite of an apple always tastes the best, which is why the heroine of a book, much more suitable to read than this one, spends an entire afternoon eating the first bite of a bushel of apples. But even this anarchic little... Anarchic... Anarchic... Little girl. The word anarchic means lo apple-loving here. Never tasted a bite as wonderful as the Baudelaire orphan's first bite of the apple from the tree their parents had hybridized with horseradish. The apple was not as bitter as the Baudelaire orphans would have guessed, and the horseradish gave the juice of the apple a slight sharp edge, like the air on a winter morning. But of course, the biggest appeal of the apple offered by the incredibly deadly viper was its immediate effect on the deadly fungus growing inside them. From the moment the Baudelaire teeth bit down on the apple, first violets and then Klaus's and then Sunny's, the stalks and caps of the medusoid mycelium began to shrink and within moments all traces of the dreaded mushroom had withered away and the children could breathe clearly and easily. Hugging one another in relief, the Baudelaire's found themselves laughing, which is a common reaction among people who have narrowly escaped death. And the snakes seemed to be laughing too, although perhaps it was just appreciating the youngest Baudelaire scratching behind its tiny hooded ears. We should each have another apple, Violet said, standing up, to make sure we've consumed enough horseradish. And we should collect enough apples for all of the islanders, Klaus said. They must be just as desperate as we were. Stockpot, Sunny said, and walked to the rack of pots on the ceiling, where the snake helped her take down an enormous metal pot that could hold a great number of apples, and in fact had been used to make an enormous vat of applesauce a number of years previously. You two start picking apples, Violet said, walking to the periscope. I want to check on Kit Snicket. The flooding of the coastal shelf must have begun by now, and she must be terrified. I hope she avoided the medusoid mycelium, Klaus said. I hate to think of what that would do to her child. Fierce, Sunny said, which meant something like, we should rescue her promptly. The islanders are in worse shape than Kit, Klaus said. We should go to Ishmael's tent first and then go rescue Kit. Violet peered through the periscope and frowned. We shouldn't go to Ishmael's tent, she said. We need to fill that stock pot with apples and get to the coastal shelf as quickly as we can. What do you mean, Klaus said. They're leaving, Violet said, and I'm sorry to say it was true. Through the periscope, the eldest Baudelaire could see the shape of the outrigger and the figures of its poisoned passengers, who were pushing it along the coastal shelf toward the library raft where Kit Snicket still lay. The three children each peered through the periscope and then looked at one another. They knew they should be hurrying, but for a moment none of the Baudelaires could move, as if they were unwilling to travel any farther in their sad history, or see one more part of their story come to an end. If you have read this far in the Chronicle of the Baudelaire Orphans, and I'm, I certainly hope you have not, then you know we have reached the 13th chapter of the 13th volume in this sad history, and so you know the end is near, even though this chapter is so lengthy that you might never reach the end of it. But perhaps you do not yet know what the end really means. The end is a phrase which refers to the completion of a story, or the final moment of some great accomplishment, such as a secret errand or a great deal of research, and indeed, this 13th volume marks the completion of my investigation into the Baudelaire case, which required much research, a great many secret errands, and the accomplishments of a number of my comrades, from a trolley driver to a botanical hybridization expert, with many, many typewriter repair people in between. But it cannot be said that the end contains the end of the Baudelaire story any more than the bad beginning contained its beginning. The children's story began long before that terrible day on Briny Beach, but there would have to be another volume to chronicle when the Baudelaires were born and when their parents were married and who was playing the violin in the candlelit restaurant when the Baudelaire parents first laid eyes on one another and what was hidden inside that violin and the childhood of the man who orphaned the girl who put it there, and even then, it could not be said that the Baudelaire story had not begun, because you would still need to know about a certain tea party held in a penthouse suite, and the baker who made the scones served at the tea party, and the baker's assistant who smuggled the secret ingredient into the scone batter through a very narrow drain pipe, and how a crafty volunteer created the illusion of a fire in the kitchen simply by wearing a certain dress and jumping around, and even then, the beginning of the story would be as far away as the shipwreck that left the Baudelaire parents as castaways on the coastal shelf 
is as far away from the outrigger on which the islanders would depart. One could say, in fact, that no story really has a beginning, and that no story really has an end, as all of the world's stories are as jumbled as the items in the Arboretum, with their details and secrets all heaped together, so that the whole story, from beginning to end, depends on how you look at it. We might even say that the world is always in medias res, a Latin phrase which means in the midst of things or in the middle of a narrative, and that it is impossible to solve any mystery or find the root of any trouble, and so the end is really the middle of the story, as many people in this history will live long past the close of chapter 13, or even the beginning of the story, as a new child arrives in the world at the chapter's close. But one cannot sit in the midst of things forever. Eventually, one must face that the end is near, and the end of the end is quite near indeed. So if I were you, I would not read the end of the end, as it contains the end of a notorious villain, but also the end of a brave and noble sibling, and the end of the colonists stay on the island as they sail off the end of the coastal shelf. The end of the end contains all these ends, and that does not depend on how you look at it. So it might be best for you to stop looking at the end before the end of the end arrives, and to stop reading the end before you read the end. As the stories that end in the end, that began in the bad beginning, are beginning to end now. The Baudelaire's hurriedly filled their stock pot with apples and ran to the coastal shelf, hurrying over the bray as quickly as they could. It was past lunchtime, and the waters of the sea were already flooding the shelf, so the water was much deeper than it had been since the children's arrival. Violet and Klaus had to hold the stock pot high in the air, and Sunny and the incredibly deadly Viper climbed up on the elder Baudelaire's shoulders to ride along with the bitter apples. The children could see Kit Snicket on the horizon, still lying on the library raft as the waters rose to soak the first few layers of books, and alongside the strange cube was the outrigger. As they drew closer, they saw that the islanders had stopped pushing the boat and were climbing aboard, pausing from time to time to cough, while at the head of the outrigger was the figure of Ishmael, seated in his clay chair, gazing at his poisoned colonists and watching the children approach. Stop! Violet cried when they were close enough to be heard. We discovered a way to dilute the poison! Baudelaire's! came the faint cry of Kit, high above the library raft. Thank goodness you're here! I think I'm going into labor! As I'm sure you know, labor is the term for the process by which a woman gives birth, and it is a Herculean task a phrase which here means something you would rather not do on a library raft floating on a flooded coastal shelf. Sunny could see from her stockpot perch, Kit holding her belly and giving the youngest Baudelaire a painful grimace. We'll help you, Violet promised, but we need to get these apples to the islanders. They won't take them, Kit said. I tried to tell them how the poison could be diluted, but they insist on just leaving. No one's forcing them, said Ishmael calmly. I merely suggested that the island was no longer a safe place and we should set sail for another one. You and the Baudelaire's are the ones who got us into this mess, came the drowsy voice of Mr. Pitcairn, thick with fungus and coconut cordial. But Ishmael's gonna get us out. This island used to be a safe place, said Professor Fletcher, far from the treachery of the world, but since you've arrived, it's become dangerous and complicated. That's not our fault. Klaus said, walking closer and closer to the outrigger as the water continued to rise. You can't live far from the treachery of the world because eventually the treachery will wash up on your shores. Exactly, said Alonzo, who yawned. You washed up and spoiled the island forever. So we're leaving it to you, cried Ariel, who coughed violently. You can have this dangerous place. We're going to sail to safety. Safe here, Sunny cried, holding up an apple. You've poisoned us enough, said Erewhon, and the islanders wheezed in agreement. We don't want to hear any more of your treacherous ideas. But you are ready to mutiny, Violet said. You didn't want to take Ishmael's suggestions. That was before the medusoid mycelium arrived, Finn said hoarsely. He's been here the longest. He knows how to keep us safe. At his suggestion, we all drank quite a bit of cordial while he figured out the root of the trouble. She paused to catch her breath as the sinister fungus continued to grow. And the root of the trouble, Baudelaire's, is you. By now the children had reached the outrigger and they looked up at Ishmael who raised his eyebrows and stared back at the frantic Baudelaire's. Why are you doing this? 
Klaus asked the facilitator. You know we're not the root of the problem. In medias res, Sunny cried. Sunny is right, Violet said. The medusoid mycelium was around before we were born, and our parents prepared for its arrival by adding horseradish to the roots of the apple trees. If they don't eat these bitter apples, Klaus pleaded, they will come to a bitter end. Tell the islanders the whole story, Ishmael, so they can save themselves. The whole story, Ishmael said, and leaned down from his chair so he could talk to the Baudelaire's without the others hearing. If I told the islanders the whole story, I wouldn't be keeping them safe from the world's terrible secrets. They almost learned the whole story this morning and began to mutiny over breakfast. If they knew all these island secrets, there'd be a schism in no time at all. Better a schism than a death, Violet said. Ishmael shook his head and fingered the wild strands of his woolly beard. No one is going to die, he said. This outrigger can take us to a beach near Lousy Lane where we can travel to a horseradish factory. You don't have time for such a long voyage, Klaus said. I think we do, Ishmael said. Even without a compass, I think I can get us to a safe place. You need a moral compass, Violet said. The spores of the medusoid mycelium can kill within the hour. The entire colony could be poisoned, and even if you make it to the shore, the fungus could spread to anyone you meet. You're not keeping anyone safe. You're endangering the whole world just to keep a few of your secrets. That is not parenting. That is horrid and wrong. I guess it depends on how you look at it, Ishmael said. Goodbye, Baudelaire. He sat up straight and called out to the wheezing islanders. I suggest you start rowing, he said, and the colonists reached their arms into the water and began to paddle the outrigger away from the children. The Baudelaire's hung on to the side of the boat and called to the islander who had first found them on the coastal shelf. Friday, Sunny cried. Take apple! Don't succumb to peer pressure, Violet begged. Friday turned to face the children and the siblings could see she was terribly frightened. Klaus quickly grabbed an apple from the stock pot and the young girl leaned out of the boat to touch his hand. I'm sorry to leave you behind, Baudelaire's, she said, but I must go with my family. I've already lost my father. I couldn't stand to lose anyone else. But your father, Klaus started to say, but Mrs. Caliban gave him a terrible look and pulled her daughter away from the edge of the outrigger. Don't rock the boat, she said. Come here and drink your cordial. Your mother is right, Friday, Ishmael said firmly. You should respect your parents' wishes. That's more than the Baudelaire's ever did. We are respecting our parents' wishes, Violet said, hoisting the apples as high as she could. They didn't want to shelter us from the world's treacheries. They wanted us to survive them. Ishmael put his hand on the stock pot of apples. What do your parents know, he asked, about surviving? And with one firm, cruel gesture, the old orphan pushed against the stock pot, and the outrigger moved out of the children's grasp. Violet and Klaus tried to take another step closer to the islanders, but the water had risen too far, and the Baudelaire feet slipped off the surface of the coastal shelf, and the siblings found themselves swimming. The stock pot tipped, and Sunny gave a small shriek and climbed down to Violet's shoulders as several apples from the pot dropped into the water with a splash. At the sound of the splash, the Baudelaire's remembered the apple core that Ishmael had dropped, and realized why the facilitator was so calm in the face of the deadly fungus, and why his voice was the only one of the islanders that wasn't clogged with stalks and caps. We have to go after them, Violet said. We may be their only chance. We can't go after them, Klaus said, still holding the apple. We have to help Kit. Split up, Sunny said, staring after the departing outrigger. Klaus shook his head. All of us need to stay if we're going to help Kit give birth. He gazed at the islanders and listened to the wheezing and coughing coming from the boat fashioned from wild grasses and the limbs of trees. They made their decision, he said finally. Contiki, Sunny said. She meant something along the lines of, there's no way they'll survive that journey. But the youngest Baudelaire was wrong. There was a way. There was a way to bring the islanders a single apple that they could share, each taking a bite of the precious bitter fruit that might tide them over. The phrase tied them over, as I'm sh sure you know, probably mean, er, means to help deal with a difficult situation. Until they reached some place or someone who could help them. Just as the three Baudelaire's shared an apple in the secret space where their parents had enabled them to survive one of the most deadly unfortunate events ever to wash up on the island shores. Whoever brought the apple to the islanders, of course would need to swim very stealthily to the outrigger, and it would help if they were quite small and slender, 
so they might escape the watchful eye of the Outrigger's facilitator. The Baudelaire's would not notice the disappearance of the incredibly deadly Viper for quite some time, as they would be focused on helping Kit, and so they could never say for sure what happened to the snake. And my research into that reptile story is incomplete, so I do not know what other chapters occurred in its history. As ink, as some prefer to call the snake, slithered from one place to the next, sometimes taking shelter from the treachery of the world, and sometimes committing treacherous acts of its own, a history not unlike that of the Baudelaire orphans, which some have called little more than the register of crimes, follies, and misfortunes of mankind. Unless you have investigated the Islander's case yourself, there's no way of knowing what happened to them as they sailed away from the colony that had been their home. But there was a way they could have survived their journey, a way that may seem fantastic, but is no less fantastic than three children helping a woman give birth. The Baudelaire's hurried to the library raft and lifted Sonny and the stockpot to the top of the raft where Kit lay, so the youngest Baudelaire could hold the wheezing woman's gloved hand and the bitter apples could dilute the poison inside her as Violet and Klaus pushed the raft back toward shore. Have an apple, Sonny offered, but Kit shook her head. I can't, she said. But you've been poisoned, Violet said. You must have caught a spore or two from the islanders as they floated by. The apples will harm the baby, Kit said. There's something in that hybrid that's bad for people who have not been born yet. That's why your mother never tasted one of her own bitter apples. She was pregnant with you, Violet. One of Kit's gloved hands drifted down over the top of the raft and patted the hair of the eldest Baudelaire. I hope I'm half as good a mother as yours was, Violet, she said. You will be, Klaus said. I don't know, Kit said. I was supposed to help you children on that day when you finally reached Briny Beach. I wanted nothing more than to take you away in my taxi to someplace safe. Instead, I threw you into a world of treachery at the Hotel de Noumal. And I wanted nothing more than to reunite you with your... than to reunite you with your friends, the Quagmires. Instead, I left them behind. She uttered a wheezy sigh and fell silent. Violet continued to guide the raft toward the island and noticed for the first time that her hands were pushing against the spine of a book whose title she recognized from the library Aunt Josephine kept underneath her bed. Ivan Lacrimose, Lake Explorer, while her brother was pushing against Mushroom Minute, a word that had been part of Fiona's mycological library. What happened? she asked, trying to imagine what strange events would have brought these books to these shores. I failed you. Kit said sadly and coughed. Quigley managed to reach the self-sustaining hot air mobile home, just as I hoped he would, and helped his siblings and Hector catch the treacherous eagles in an enormous net, while I met Captain Wittershins and his stepchildren. Fernald and Fiona? Klaus said, referring to the hook-handed man who had once worked for Count Olaf, and the young woman who had broken his heart. But they betrayed him and us. The captain had forgiven the failures of those he had loved. Kit said, as I hope you will forgive mine, Baudelaire's. We made a desperate attempt to repair the Queequeg and reach the Quagmires as their aerial battle continued and arrived just in time to see the balloons of the self-sustaining hot airmobile home pop under the cruel beaks of the escaping eagles. They tumbled down to the surface of the sea and crashed into the Queequeg. In moments we were all castaways, treading water in the midst of all the items that survived the wreck. She was silent for a moment. Fiona was so desperate to reach you, Klaus, she said. She wanted you to forgive her as well. Did... did she... Klaus could not bear to finish his question. I mean, uh, what happened next? I don't know, Kit admitted. From the depths of the sea, a mysterious figure approached, almost like a question mark, rising out of the water. We saw that on a radar screen, Violet remembered. Captain Wittershins refused to tell us what it was. My brother used to call it the Great Unknown, Kit said, clasping her belly as the baby kicked violently. I was terrified, Baudelaire's. Quickly, I fashioned a vaporetto of favorite detritus, as I'd been trained to do. Vaporetto? Sonny asked. It's an Italian term for boat, Kit said. It was one of the many Italian phrases Monty taught me. A vaporetto of favorite detritus is a way of saving yourself and your favorite things all at the same time. 
I gathered all the books in reach that I enjoyed, tossing the boring ones into the sea, but everyone else wanted to take their chances with the great unknown. I begged the others to climb aboard as the question mark approached, but only Ink managed to reach me. The others... Her voice trailed off, and for a moment, Kit did nothing but wheeze. In an instant, they were gone, either swallowed up or rescued by that mysterious thing. You don't know what happened to them? Klaus asked. Kit shook her head. All I heard, she said, was one of the quagmires calling Violet's name. Sunny looked into the face of the distraught woman. Quigley? The youngest Baudelaire could not help asking. Or Duncan? I don't know, Kit said again. I'm sorry, Baudelaire's. I failed you. You succeeded in your noble errands at the Hotel de Numont and saved Dewey and the others, but I don't know if we'll ever see the Quagmires and their companions again. I hope you will forgive my failures, and when I see Dewey again, I hope he will forgive me too. The Baudelaire orphans looked at one another sadly, realizing it was time to, at last to tell Kit Snicket the whole story, as she had told them. We'll forgive your failures, Violet said, if you forgive ours. We failed you too, Violet said. We had to burn down the Hotel de Numont, and we don't know if anyone escaped to safety. Sunny gripped Kit's hand in hers. And Dewey is dead, she said, and everyone burst into tears. There is a kind of crying I hope you have not experienced, and is not just crying about something terrible that has happened, but a crying for all of the terrible things that have happened. Not just to you, but to everyone you know, and to everyone you don't know, and even the people you don't want to know. A crying that cannot be diluted by a brave deed or a kind word, but only by someone holding you as your shoulders shake and your tears run down your face. Sunny held Kit, and Violet held Klaus, and for a moment the four castaways did nothing but weep, letting their tears run down their faces and into the sea, which some have said is nothing but a library of all the tears in history. Kit and the children let their sadness join the sadness of the world and cried for all of the people who were lost to them. They cried for Dewey Denouement and for the Quagmire Triplets, and for all of their companions and guardians, friends and associates, and for all of the failures they could forgive and all of the treacheries they could endure. They cried for the world, and most of all, of course, the Baudelaire orphans cried for their parents who they knew finally they would never see again. Even though Kit Snicket had not brought news of their parents, her story of the great unknown made them see at last that the people who had written all those chapters in a series of unfortunate events were gone forever into the great unknown, and that Violet, Klaus, and Sunny would be orphans forever, too. Stop, Kit said finally, through her fading tears. Stop pushing the raft, I cannot go on. We have to go on, Violet said. We're almost at the beach, Klaus said. The shelf is flooding, Sunny said. Let it flood, Kit said. I can't do it, Baudelaire's. I've lost too many people. My parents, my true love, and my brothers. At the mention of Kit's brothers, Violet thought to reach into her pocket, and she retrieved the ornate ring, emblazoned with the initial R. Sometimes the things you've lost can be found again in unexpected places, she said, and held the ring up for Kit to see. The distraught woman removed her gloves and held the ring in her bare and trembling hand. This isn't mine, she said. It belonged to your mother. Before it belonged to our mother, Klaus said, it belonged to you. Its history began before we were born, Kit said, and it should continue after we die. Give it to my child, Baudelaire's. Let my child be part of my history, even if the baby is an orphan and all alone in this world. The baby will not be alone, Violet said fiercely. If you die, Kit, we will raise this child as our own. I could not ask for better, Kit said quietly. Name the baby after one of your parents, Baudelaire's. The custom of my family is to name a baby for someone who has died. Ours, too, Sunny said, remembering something her father had told her when she had inquired about her own name. Our families have always been close, Kit said, even if we had to stay apart from one another. Now finally we are all together as if we are one family. Then let us help you, Sunny said, 
and with a weepy, wheezy nod, Kit Snicket let the Baudelaire's push her vaporetto of favorite detritus off the coastal shelf and onto the shores of the island where eventually everything arrives, just as the outrigger disappeared on the horizon. The children gazed at the islanders for the last time, at least as far as I know, and then at the cube of books, and tried to imagine how the injured, pregnant, and distraught woman could get to a safe place to birth a child. Can you lower yourself down? Violet asked. Kit shook her head. It hurts, she said, her voice thick with the poisonous fungus. We can carry her, Klaus said, but Kit shook her head again. I'm too heavy, she said weakly. I could fall from your grasp and hurt the baby. We could invent a way to get you to shore, Violet said. Yes, Klaus said, we just need to run to the Arboretum to find out what we need. No time, Sunny said, and Kit nodded in agreement. The baby's coming quickly, she said. Find someone to help you? We're alone, Violet said, but then she and her siblings gazed out at the beach where the raft had arrived, and the Baudelaire saw, crawling out of Ishmael's tent, the one person for whom they had not shed a tear. Sunny slid down to the sand, bringing the stock pot with her, and the three children hurried up the slope to the struggling figure of Count Olaf. Hello, orphans, he said, his voice even wheezier and rougher from the spreading poison of the medusoid mycelium. Esme's dress had fallen away from his skinny body, and he was crawling on the sand in his regular clothes, with one hand holding a seashell of cordial and the other clutching at his chest. "'Are you here to bow before the king of Olaf land?' "'We don't have time for your nonsense,' Violet said. "'We need your help.' Count Olaf's eyebrows, eyebrows raised, and he gave the children an astonished glare. "'You need my help?' he asked. "'What happened to all those island fools?' They abandoned us, Klaus said. Olaf wheezed horridly, and it took the siblings a moment to realize he was laughing. How do you like them apples, he sputtered, using an expression which means I find this situation quite remarkable. We'll give you apples, Sonny said, gesturing to the stock pot, if you help. I don't want fruit, Olaf snarled and tried to sit up, his hand still clutching his chest. I want the fortune your parents left behind. The fortune isn't here, Violet said. None of us may ever see a penny of that money. Even if it were here, Klaus said, you might not live to enjoy it. MacGuffin, Sonny said, which meant your scheming means nothing in this place. Count Olaf raised the seashell to his lips and the Baudelaire's could see he was trembling. Maybe I'll just stay here, he said hoarsely. I've lost too much to go on. My parents, my true love my henchfolk, an enormous amount of money I didn't earn, even the boat with my name on it. The three children looked at one another, remembering their time on that boat and recalling that they had considered throwing him overboard. If Olaf had drowned in the sea, the medusoid mycelium might never have threatened the island, although the deadly fungus eventually would have washed up on its shores. And if the villain were dead, then there would be no one on the beach who might help Kit Snicket and her child. Violet knelt on the sand and grabbed the villain's shoulders with both hands. We have to go on, she said. Do one good thing in your life, Olaf. I've done lots of good things in my life, he snarled. I once took in three orphans, and I've been considered for several prestigious theatrical awards. Klaus knelt down beside his sister and stared into the villain's shiny eyes. You're the one who made us orphans in the first place, he said, uttering out loud for the first time a secret that all three Baudelaire's had kept in their hearts for almost as long as they could remember. Olaf closed his eyes for a moment, grimacing in pain, then stared slowly at each of the three children in turn. "'Is that what you think?' he said finally. "'We know it,' Sonny said. "'You don't know anything,' Count Olaf said. "'You three children are the same as when I first laid eyes on you.' You think you can triumph in this world with nothing more than a keen mind, a pile of books, and the occasional gourmet meal. He poured one last gulp of cordial into his poisoned mouth before throwing the seashell into the sand. You're just like your parents, he said, and from the shore, the children heard Kit Snicket moan. You have to help Kit, Sonny said. Violet said, the baby is arriving. Kit? Count Olaf said, and in one swift gesture, he grabbed an apple from the stock pot and took a savage bite. He chewed, wincing in pain, and the Baudelaire's listened as his wheezing settled and the poisonous fungus was diluted by their parents' invention. He took another bite and another, and then with a horrible groan, the villain rose to his feet, 
and the children saw that his chest was soaked with blood. You're hurt, Klaus said. I've been hurt before, Count Olaf said, and he staggered down the slope and waded into the waters of the flooded coastal shelf. In one smooth gesture, he lifted Kit from the raft and carried her onto the shores of the island. The distraught woman's eyes were closed, and as the Baudelaire's hurried down to her, they were not sure she was alive until Olaf laid her carefully down on the white sands of the beach, and the children saw her chest heaving with breath. The villain stared at Kit for one long moment, and then he leaned down and did a strange thing. As the Baudelaire orphans looked on, Count Olaf gave Kit Snicket a gentle kiss on her trembling mouth. Yuck, said Sonny, as Kit's eyes fluttered open. I told you, Count Olaf said weakly. I told you I'd do that one last time. You're a wicked man, Kit said. Do you think one kind act will make me forgive you for your failings? The villain stumbled a few steps away and then sat down on the sand and uttered a deep sigh. I haven't apologized, he said, looking first at the pregnant woman and then at the Baudelaire's. Kit reached out and touched the man's ankle, right on the tattoo of an eye that had haunted the children since they had first seen it. Violet, Klaus, and Sonny looked at the tattoo, remembering all of the times it had been disguised, and all of the times it had been revealed. And they thought of all the other places they had seen it. For if you looked carefully, the drawing of an eye also spelled out the initials VFD. And as the children had investigated the volunteer fire department, first trying to decode the organization's sinister mysteries and then trying to participate in its noble errands, it seemed that these eyes were watching them, though whether the eyes were noble or treacherous, good or evil, seemed even now to be a mystery. The whole story of these eyes, it seemed, might always be hidden from the children, kept in darkness along with all the other eyes watching all the other orphans every day and every night. The night has a thousand eyes, Kit said hoarsely, and lifted her head to face the villain. The Baudelaire's could tell by her voice that she was reciting the words of someone else. And the day but one, yet the light of the bright world dies with the dying sun. The mind has a thousand eyes, but the heart has one. Yet the light of a whole life dies when love is done. Count Olaf gave Kit a faint smile. You're not the only one who can recite the words of our associates he said, and then gazed out at the sea. The afternoon was nearly over, and soon the island would be covered in darkness. Man hands on misery to man, the villain said. It deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as early as you can. Here he coughed, a ghastly sound, and his hands clutched his chest. And don't have any kids yourself, he finished, and uttered a short, sharp laugh. Then the villain's story came to an end. Olaf lay back on the sand, far from the treachery of the world, and the children stood on the beach and stared into his face. His eyes shone brightly and his mouth opened as if he wanted to tell them something, but the Baudelaire orphans never heard Count Olaf say another word. Kit gave a cry of pain, thick with poisonous fungus, and clutched her heaving belly, and the Baudelaire's hurried to help her. They did not even notice when Count Olaf closed his eyes for the last time, and perhaps this is a good time for you to close your eyes too. Not just to avoid reading the end of the Baudelaire story, but to imagine the beginning of another. It is likely your own eyes were closed when you were born, so that you left the safe place of your mother's womb, or if you're a seahorse, your father's yoke sack, and joined the treachery of the world without seeing exactly where you were going. You did not yet know the people who were helping you make your way here or the people who would shelter you as your life began, when you were even smaller and more delicate and demanding than you are now. It seems strange that you would do such a thing and leave yourself in the care of strangers for so long, only gradually opening your eyes to see what all the fuss was about. And yet this is the way nearly everyone comes into the world. Perhaps if we saw what was ahead of us, and glimpsed the crimes, follies, and misfortunes that would befall us later on, we would all stay in our mother's wombs, and then there would be nobody in the world but a great number of very fat, very irritated women. In any case, this is how all our stories begin, in darkness with our eyes closed, and all our stories end the same way, too, with all of us uttering some last words, or perhaps someone else's, before slipping back into darkness as our series of unfortunate events comes to an end. 
And in this way, with the journey taken by Kit Snicket's baby, we reach the end of a series of unfortunate events as well. For some time, Kit Snicket's labor was very difficult, and it seemed to the children that things were moving in an aberrant, a word aberrant here means very, very wrong and causing much grief, direction. But finally, into the world came a baby girl, just as I'm very, very sorry to say, her mother and my sister slipped away from this world after a long night of suffering, but also a night of joy, as the birth of a baby is always good news, no matter how much bad news the baby will hear later. The sun rose over the coastal shelf, which would not flood again for another year, and the Baudelaire orphans held the baby on the shore and watched as her eyes opened for the first time. Kit Snicket's daughter squinted at the sunrise and tried to imagine where in the world she was. And of course, as she wondered this, she began to cry. The girl, named after the Baudelaire's mother, howled and howled, and as her series of unfortunate events began, this history of the Baudelaire orphans ended. This is not to say, of course, that the Baudelaire orphans died that day. They were far too busy. Although they were still children, the Baudelaires were parents now, and there was quite a lot to do. Violet designed and built the equipment necessary for raising an infant, using the library of detritus stored in the shade of the apple tree. Klaus searched the enormous bookcase for information on childcare and kept careful track of the baby's progress. Sunny herded and milked the wild sheep to provide nourishment for the baby and used the whisk Friday had given her to make soft foods as the baby's teeth came in. And all three Baudelaire's planted seeds from the bitter apples all over the island to chase away any traces of the medusoid mycelium, even though they remembered it grew best in small enclosed spaces. So the deadly fungus had no chance to harm the child and so the island would remain as safe as it was on the day they arrived. These chores took all day, and at night, while the baby was learning to sleep, the Baudelaires would sit together in the two large reading chairs and take turns reading out loud from the book their parents had left behind, and sometimes they would flip to the back of the book and add a few lines to the history themselves. While reading and writing, the siblings had found many answers for which they had been looking, although each answer, of course, only brought forth another mystery, as there were many details of the Baudelaires' lives that seemed like a strange, unreadable shape of some great unknown but this did not concern them as much as you might think. One cannot spend forever sitting and solving the mysteries of one's history, and no matter how much one reads, the whole story can never be told. But it was enough. Reading their parents' words was, under the circumstances, the best for which the Baudelaire orphans could hope. As the night grew later, they would drop off to sleep, just as their parents did, in the chairs in the secret space beneath the roots of the bitter apple tree, in the Arboretum on an island far, far from the treachery of the world. Several hours later, of course, the baby would wake up and fill the space with confused and hungry cries. The Baudelaires took turns, and while the other two children slept, one Baudelaire would carry the baby, in a sling Violet had designed, out of the Arboretum and up to the top of the Bray, where they would sit, infant and parent, and have breakfast while staring at the sea. Sometimes they would visit Kit Snicket's grave, where they would lay a few wildflowers, or the grave of Count Olaf, where they would merely stand silent for a few moments. In many ways, the lives of the Baudelaire orphans that year is not unlike my own, now that I have concluded my investigation. Like Violet, like Klaus, and like Sunny, I visit certain graves, and often spend my mornings standing on a bray, staring out at the same sea. It's not the whole story, of course, but it is enough. Under the circumstances, it is the best for which you can hope. That one's a that one's a rough one. Let me catch up. Grim Reaper's just doing the job. Thank you for that host hammer. I hope you're doing well. Aw, oh, snake pets, I know. Hey Arox, hope you're doing well as well. I hope the days get better for you, Arox. Yeah, oh, the little two people holding hands in the bottom right. It's part of the uh, wallpaper that I grabbed off Google. This book is giving me an existential crisis right now. Eventually one must face the end. Like, dang, this is not what I signed up for, Snicket Boy. 
the ending of an end is a beginning, so it's fine. That's true. Was that my drunk voice? Yes. Wow. Double wow wow. <laughs> Throw apples at their faces. Get them. That's a little aggressive. Is it really? I didn't say it was uncalled for. <laughs> Can't be a bad mother if you're dead. <laughs> the good old agreement on just being okay with respective failures. Holy cannolis, this book is really taking a medieval crossbow and shooting you right in the honey nut filios right now. <laughs> oh no, I'm sorry. You don't know anything, heard that before. <laughs> Thank you for the claps. I know this is a hard one, right? We still have a little bit to go. A little bit. <clears throat> so let's knock that out. Thank you guys for hanging in with me during the sad parts. To my kind editor, the end of the end can be found at the end of the end. With all due respect, Lemony Snicket. Chapter 14 For Beatrice, we are like boats passing in the night, particularly you. The last entry in the Baudelaire parents' handwriting in a series of unfortunate events reads as follows. As we suspected, we are to be castaways once more. The others believe that the island should stay far from the treachery of the world, and so this safe place is too dangerous for us. We'll, we will leave by a boat B has built and named after me. I am heartbroken, but I have been heartbroken before, and this might be the best for which I can hope. We cannot truly shelter our children here or anywhere else, and so it might be best for us and for the baby to immerse ourselves in the world. By the way, if it is a girl, we will name her Violet, and if it is a boy, we will name him Lemony. The Baudelaire orphans read this entry one evening after a supper of seaweed salad, crab cakes, and roast lamb, and when Violet finished reading, all three children laughed. Even Kit's baby sitting on Sunny's knee uttered a happy shriek, Lemony, Violet repeated. They would have named me Lemony? Where did they get that idea? From someone who died, presumably, Klaus said. Remember the family custom? Lemony Baudelaire, Sonny tried, and the baby laughed again. The baby was nearly a year old and looked very much like her mother. They never told us about a Lemony, Violet said, and ran her hair through her hands. Ran her hair through her hands? She had been repairing the water filtration system all day and was quite tired. Klaus poured his sisters more coconut milk, which the children preferred to drink fresh. They didn't tell us a lot of things, he said. What do you think it means I've been heartbroken before? You know what heartbroken means, Sonny said, and then nodded as the baby murmured, Abelard! The youngest Baudelaire was best at deciphering the infant's somewhat unusual way of speaking. I think it means we should leave, Violet said. Leave the island, Klaus said, and go where? Anywhere, Violet said. We can't stay here forever. There's everything we might need, but it's not right to be so far from the world. And it's treachery? Sunny asked. You'd think we would have had enough treachery for a lifetime, Klaus said. But there's more to life than safety. Our parents left, Violet said. Maybe we should honor their wishes. Check Rio, the baby said, and the Baudelaire's considered her for a moment. Kit's daughter was growing up very quickly, and she eagerly explored the island at every opportunity. All three siblings had to keep a close eye on her, particularly in the Arboretum, which was still heaping with detritus, even after a year of cataloging. Many of the items in the enormous library were dangerous for babies, of course, but the infant had never had a serious injury. The baby had heard about danger, too, mostly from the Register of Crimes, Follies, and Misfortunes of Mankind, from which the Baudelaire's read out loud each evening although they had not told the infant the whole story. She did not know all of the Baudelaire secrets, and indeed there were some she would never know. We can't shelter her forever, Klaus said. In any case, treachery will wash up on these shores. I'm surprised it hasn't already, Violet said. Plenty of things have been shipwrecked here, but we haven't seen a single castaway. If we leave, Sunny asked, what will we find? The Baudelaire's fell silent. 
Because no castaways had arrived in the year, they had little news of the world, aside from a few scraps of newspaper that had survived a terrible storm. Judging from the articles, they were still villains loosed in the world, although a few volunteers also appeared to have survived all of the troubles that had brought the children to the island. The articles, however, were from the Daily Punctilio, so the children could not be sure they were accurate. For all they knew, the islanders had spread the medusoid mycelium and the entire world might be poisoned. This, however, seemed unlikely, as the world, no matter how monstrously it may be threatened, has never been known to succumb entirely. The Baudelaire's also thought of all the people they hoped to see again, although sadly this also seemed unlikely, though not impossible. We won't know until we get there, Violet said. Well, if we're leaving, we better hurry, Klaus said. He stood up and walked to the bench where the middle Baudelaire had fashioned a calendar he believed to be fairly accurate. The coastal shelf will flood soon. We won't need much, Sonny said. We have quite a bit of non-perishable food. I've cataloged quite a bit of naval equipment, Violet said. I have some good maps, Klaus said, but we should also make room for some of our favorite detritus. I have some novels by P.G. Wodehouse I've been meaning to get to. Blueprints, Violet said thoughtfully. My whisk, Sunny said, looking at the item that Friday had smuggled her long ago, which had turned out to be a very handy utensil even after the baby had outgrown whisked foods. Cake, shrieked the baby, and her guardians laughed. Do we take this? Violet asked, holding up the book from which she had read out loud. I don't think so, Klaus said. Perhaps another castaway will arrive and continue the history. In any case, Sunny said, they'll have something to read. So we're really leaving, Violet said, and they really were. After a good night's sleep, the Baudelaire's began to prepare for their voyage, and it was true they didn't need much. Sunny was able to pack a great deal of food that would be perfect for the journey, and even managed to sneak in a few luxuries, such as some roe she had harvested from local fishes, and a somewhat bitter but still tasty apple pie. Klaus rolled several maps into a neat cylinder and added a number of useful and entertaining items from the vast library. Violet added some blueprints and equipment to the pile and then selected a boat from all the shipwrecks that lay in the Arboretum. The eldest Baudelaire had been surprised to find that the boat that looked best for the task was the one on which they had arrived, although by the time she was done repairing and readying it for the voyage, she was not surprised after all. She repaired the hull of the boat and fastened new sails to the masts, and finally she looked at the nameplate reading Count Olaf, and with a small frown, she tore through the tape and removed it. As the children had noticed on their voyage to the island, there was another nameplate underneath, and when Violet read what it said and called her siblings and adopted daughter over to sea, yet another question about their lives was answered and yet another mystery had begun. Finally, the day for departure arrived, and as the coastal shelf began to flood, the Baudelaire's carried the boat, or as Uncle Monty, Monty might have put it, Vaporetto, down to the beach and began to load all of their supplies. Violet, Klaus, and Sunny gazed at the white sands of the beach, where new apple trees were beginning to grow. The children spent nearly all of their time in the Arboretum, and so the, this side of the island where the colony had been now felt like the far side of the island rather than where their parents had lived. Are we ready to immerse ourselves in the world? Violet asked. I just hope we don't immerse ourselves in the sea, Klaus said with a small smile. Me too, Sunny said and smiled back at her brother. Where's the baby? Violet said. I want to make sure these life jackets I've designed will fit properly. She wanted to say goodbye to her mother. Sunny said, she'll be along soon. Sure enough, the tiny figure of Kit's daughter could be seen crawling over the brae toward the children and their boat. The Baudelaire's watched her approach, wondering what the next chapter in this infant's life would be, and indeed that's difficult to say. There are some who say that the Baudelaire's rejoined VFD and are engaged in brave errands to this day, perhaps under different names to avoid being captured. There are others who say they perished at sea, although rumors of one's death crop up so often or, and are so often revealed to be untrue. But in any case, as my investigation is over, we have indeed reached the last chapter of the Baudelaire's story, even if the Baudelaire's had not. The three children climbed into the boat and waited for the baby to crawl to the water's edge where she could pull herself into a standing position by clinging to the back of the boat. Soon the coastal shelf would flood and the Baudelaire orphans would be on their way, immersing themselves in the world and leaving this story forever. Even the baby clutching the boat, whose story had just begun, would soon vanish from this chronicle, after uttering just a few words. Vi! she cried, which was her way of greeting Violet. Clow! Son! We wouldn't leave without you, Violet said, smiling down at the baby. 
Come aboard, Klaus said, talking to her as if she were an adult. You little thing, Sunny said, using a term of endearment she had made up herself. The baby paused and looked back at the looked at the back of the boat, where the nameplate had been affixed. She had no way of knowing this, of course, but the nameplate had been nailed to the back of the boat by a person standing on the very spot she was standing, at least as far as my research has shown. The infant was standing on a spot in someone else's story during a moment of her own, but she was thinking neither of the story far in the past nor of her own, which stretched into the future like the open sea. She was gazing at the nameplate, and her forehead was wrinkled in concentration. Finally, she uttered a word. The Baudelaire orphans gasped when they heard it, for they could not say for sure whether she was reading the word out loud or merely stating her own name, and indeed they never learned this. Perhaps this last word was the baby's first secret, joining the secrets the Baudelaire's were keeping from the baby and all the other secrets immersed in the world. Perhaps it is better not to know precisely what was meant by this word, as some things are better left in the great unknown. There are some words, of course, that are better left unsaid, but not, I believe, the word uttered by my niece, a word which here means that the story is over. Beatrice. That's it. Let me catch up. There were sad parts. I got choked up when uh, Kit asked uh, the Baudelaire's if they'd forgive her. No, 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 Beatrice. It's just that you're large as a barge. <laughs> I respect you do reading streams. If I were to do one, it would literally take me 12 hours to get through. Oh, no. I, I've been reading out loud to, like, my mom and my sister since I was, like, seven, eight, nine years old. So I think the reason that I can read fairly smoothly is just because I've practiced it for like my whole life. Um, cause I, I can, I can remember every time I was in the car with my mom and my sister, I would read a book, um, out loud, which was just a strange thing we did, but I'm grateful for what we did. And yes, like, uh, Tara and Riddy said, I would totally listen to that even if it was 12 hours long. The Daily Punctilio being this world's New York Post. Cake is the most important thing to take. It is kind of weird to hear Sunny speak in full sentences, but I guess it just kind of helps signify that, like, she's grown up. It's probably a swear word the baby used. Guess first. <laughs> no. Claps from, for chapter 14 and the book and the whole series. Standing o ovation. Thank you so much. Claps for chapter 14, the book, the whole dang series of unfortunate events. The wonderful stream. Thank you so much. Claps for Beatrice. That's right. Great reading. Thank you so much. You're welcome for the stream, Celeste. LMAO. <laughs> April Fool's Day reading stream coming soon. Yes. Let's do it, Storm. Belatedly clasps. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. Large bars, Beatrice. <laughs> All right, everybody. I feel kind of weird saying this, but that is the end of a series of unfortunate events. Um, something that took three and a half years to complete on stream is now come to fruition and I appreciate everybody who has um, helped that to become my most viewed videos on YouTube surprisingly people like these book streams more than they like any game that I play um, which is just so such a surprising thing I never thought it would end up that way but um, I appreciate everybody who has uh, uh, stuck with the channel and the um, the series um, as I read them, um, but yep, it took three and a half years. Oh, the reading of it was a series of wonderful events, and you're welcome for making them happen. Um, so I'm gonna call it here. Uh, I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your evening. Um, I will not be streaming for a while. Um, I'm not gonna, I can't stream tomorrow or Sunday, and I leave on Monday for a week-long vacation, which is wonderful, and I'm looking much forward to it. But I will be gone Monday to Monday, so streams will come back at the earliest on Tuesday the 28th. Um, but depending on my work schedule, which I don't have yet, um, I'll, you know, let you guys know. But it'll be a while, so this is my last stream for a little bit. But I will see you in about a, a week and a half or so. Um, take care of yourself, everybody. Until I see you again, much, much love. I really appreciate you all again. I just want to reiterate it over and over again. Um, have a wonderful day.
a great week. Um, all my best to you guys always, and I'll see you all shortly. Bye.